Welcome to the Layman Seminary. We're continuing our series today on dispensationalism. We have Dane, we have Janet, and we have Jonah. Uh, Josh is not able to attend this time, uh, but he's here in spirit. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, Janet, you want to pray us in? Janet, your mic's muted. <laughs> sorry. I just didn't do this. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, let's pray. All right. Okay, let's pray. Father God, once again, thank you so much for all what you have done in our lives. Every morning, oh dear God, you bless us a lot. Um, thank you so much for the life that you have given us. And today, dear God, uh, we are about to discuss uh, uh, about dispensationalism, oh Lord, and I pray that you will give us wisdom and understanding, the right uh, thought or the right doctrine of our God about dispensationalism. And dear God, we seek the truth. And I hope, dear God, that you will be with us and giving us understanding. And I pray also to the people who are watching with this video, dear God, that you will bless them, give them understanding uh, what we are talking about. And Lord, uh, I pray that many people will come to you to study your word. Lord, thank you so much. And bless this moment, oh Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, last time we, we did the video, we, we studied about is innocence a dispensation, right? Well, in order to continue what we were talking about last time, I need to ask this question because we're going to go deeper into it. What would y'all say are the essentials of dispensationalism? Have y'all ever heard that term before? I heard that question from you. Okay. Are you, yeah. sh are you sure you heard it from me? Just or was it a oh. <laughs> question. <laughs> okay. Josh is not here, so maybe, and, and also, I drink this crazy thing, so. Uh, this one. Oh, yeah, Janet's taking allergy medicine, so, so if she's a little loopy, that's the reason. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I want everyone to be aware of it. So, um, what are the essential of dispensationalism? Yeah. What are the essential? I think yeah. I want to paint first, so that we can... Um, yeah, Dane, go ahead, interact real quick. Have that, have yeah, that. I've not heard the term, but it's understandable to me um, what the question is asking. Okay. Um, the essentials of dispensationalism. What would you say are the essentials? Of the essentials in terms of understanding it or in... Uh, recognizing it as present in scripture. Well, let's go with understanding uh, it and then maybe mm -hmm. I'll see what you're talking about for our scripture first. Let's start there. What um, as far as understanding it, um, what a foundational essential, I guess, would be a process through which to uh, interpret it so that we can all come out on the same page. So I'd say we'd need to do some sort of a study into where do we get this term? What does the term actually mean? Dispensational. Uh, so like uh, the oikonomia, what parameters in the scriptural language um, does that have? Okay. So you're basically saying that we need to, do, that we're involved in literal interpretation right mm -hmm. yeah okay. so what are what are the essentials of dispensationalism right. there are so, three essentials of for me okay and what are you saying these three are Janet? the three essential is the uh, grammatical historical and that was not another one grammatical <laughs> historical and you could say and contextual the, Context. That's the same thing as literal interpretation. Okay, next. Okay, so. <laughs> Come on, 
What? I thought and, Jonah was saying something. Go ahead, Jamie. Yeah. No. And what's your yeah. number two? Oh, my number two is um yeah, as what Dane said that you know, I think all of what I'm saying is in the liter in the number one category, literal. So I don't have any three because that the three that I wanted to mention is already in, included in the literal interpretation. Okay. What about Dane? Anything else? You approach you approach the text literally. You do a word study. You come to yeah. that conclusion. What 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 else do you find through literal interpretation of scripture? It's not that the grammatical historical historical. That's context. the process: grammar, mm -hmm. history, and context. That's all there. What you find, and this is, remember Rari sine qua non? Mm -hmm. The distinction yep. between Israel and the church. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then he would say the next one is the distinction. The, I need to get a stylus one day. <laughs> um, a, the distinction, that word is distinction. And then the third one would be the mm -hmm. glory of God. Okay. Okay. Well, this, the essentials is, is Michael Vlock's uh, term, mm. okay? And he's basically going to revamp these and we're going to explore some of that, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so literal... And that's why we're going back into it. Even though we've given Rari's sine qua non, Rari's definitions, Rari's articulations of things doesn't... Uh, dispensationalism doesn't hang uh only on rari's explanation of things you know mm -hmm. uh we want to be inductive as possible as we're studying this we want our beliefs our, our articulations to reflect what's in the text so we consider you know these other definitions and things like that as we're working through distinction right. and then the glory of god is the third one right Right, yeah, that's the sine qua non, rari sine qua nons. But those are challenged sometimes, or they're argued that they're not clear enough. And so we're going to be exploring that as well. See, I always start out, I mean, we, we start out with major Bible themes, those type of ideas. We start out with Rari's dispensationalism, and we build from there. But those books are frozen in time. And since they've been written, other dispensationalists have articulated other things. So I just don't want to just study a book that's frozen in time. I want us to be involved in the, the current discussion so that we're developing our work and definition, our articulation. And so remember last time we dealt with this issue here, um, this question here, is the presence of sin required for a dispensation to exist? Again, what, what, Jonah? Oh, sorry. It's okay. Um, but wait and hear. She's muted in. now. Okay. Um, so, is the presence of sin required for dispensation exists? Janet, yes or no? Let's get your yes or no. Uh, if it's wait, okay. If it's like human test is involved, I may say yes. Okay. So, uh, so the before Adam and Eve sin is that a dispensation? Uh, yes. Is innocence a dispensation? Oh, my goodness, I, no, it may clear to me now. <laughs> it's okay, no problem. It's it. Uh, wait, is the presence of sin required for a dispensation to exist? Uh, yeah, I changed my answer. I said no. Okay, you say no, Dane. <laughs> yes or no? I'm going to say no, my, but um, I have a booted. thought. Okay, let's hear your thought. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would this, if someone did say yes, would the distinction of sin being present, uh, would it exclude innocence because innocence ended because of the presence of sin? Yes, that's what I'm thinking uh, also. Yes, and it, would, even, it would exclude even during innocence. the millennium. Um, there will be a revolt at the end of the millennium, which is mm -hmm. a sinful revolt. Um, 
So I would say no, um, but uh, not dogmatically. Okay, Jonna? Um, yes or no? Yeah, I will. I, 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 I agree with Dane. I said no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I will agree with Dane and say no. <laughs> so what you're saying is no, right? No, but I'm thinking also because dispensation is about really uh, the definition of right is a God's rule. So I'm thinking if if even if without sin, still God is ruling in time of innocence. I mean, <laughs> yes, good, good. So that's what I'm thinking. So even without sin, God's still ruling, and that's how God so created. To, I mean, good, Jonah. Go ahead, Janet. No, I'm thinking. No, I'm just. I just gave up. My brain is booted, but <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm drunk. Now. All right, all right. You know, so, well, yeah. it come what back. I'm trying, what I'm trying to say, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, uh, I said earlier that if I said yes, uh, I was thinking about it. Uh, the innocence then is not dispensation, so I changed my mind. But when it says that, is the presence of sin required for a dispensation to exist? Um, I want to ask a question: Is the in, uh, angels? Sin uh, angels are sinning, or during the angelic realm, are they sinning? Why we need to judge well, the angels if they Lucifer, are not sinning? If they are not, well, Lucifer sinned, yes, and the, and you know, there's going to be a third that will re ultimately rebel. I mean, I think they've already rebelled, but the pr passage in Revelation hasn't occurred yet. Um, so if you want to make the dispensation of angels a dispensation then yeah you would have sin you would have sin that would break that dispensation if you will so the sin would bring it into it so you might want to think of it like this with angels you have an innocence and with uh humans you have an innocence yeah the same thing right in human yeah, you, if, you, if you were trying to describe a dispensation of angels, you might have to describe it as the, the uh, angelic innocence or something. I don't know. You'd have to come up with a term like that. Yeah, so might, might be they have four dispensation then, the angelic realm. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you do bring up a good point. You have the angels before they sin, and you have the angels after they sin, right? And you have a period in time in which the angels uh, in the future are going to be given well, through the demons. You know, mm -hmm. when the church is removed, they're going to be given a deeper uh, or more fuller reign of things. So you could do that. I mean, like I said, I don't think Daniel Godfrey has developed his belief about a possibility of a dispensation of angels. But he said that it, it would be parallel to the to the humans. So it could be possible that one could articulate it out. You could trace the, the angelic conflict uh, throughout and maybe, you know, it's it's a thought to yeah, think because about. The, yeah, because the, if not, then we don't have eternal state dispensation. Right, mm -hmm. right. There's no sin in the eternal state. Yeah. So in this view, the presence of sin would eliminate that, okay? Remember, the whole purpose of this is we're dealing with presuppositions, how that affects how, uh, what we see in the text. Okay, so if if sin does do that, that rules out the Trinity as a dispensation, which we talked about before. The pre-fall angels. Uh, see, Janet, I was already thinking about what you were saying, too. Uh, the yeah, eternal I state. I know, you did good. The pre-fall angels, the eternal state, and innocence. That would rule those out. Okay, so here's the next question. Why would a person assume sin must be present for a dispensation to exist? What would must assume sin must be present? Um, this too is T-O-O. -O, must be present also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe Is 
It's um, come on, Janet. Just start talking. Don't don't hesitate. That medicine got you going slow. Just talk fast. What's in your brain? No, it's very true. Why would a person assume sin must be present too for a dispensation to exist? Here, this confuses you. Just but, ignore that too. But we are present for a dispensation. Oh, because it's yeah, it it will become uh, in uh, what is your definition of a dispensation? Because why would a but if God, if if the dispensation is ruling for only humanity, then uh, it's so very difficult. Sorry. Uh, well, well, let's let Dane talk, and maybe you'll get your thoughts. Go ahead, Dane. Uh. I don't have a, a clear reason in my mind, but I would think it might have something to do with the um, the it being an economy of God that He is uh, ruling over some uh, an economy. Therefore, perhaps they're looking at His rule as something that has to be um, soteriological. Yeah, um, I, and that's what I think. Ha that's what I think ha is happening here. Uh, a person that believes that sin must be present for dispensation exists, their soteriology, their view of salvation is driving mm -hmm. it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whether yes. that's they're holding on to a theological covenant of redemption or, or, or so grace no or whatever. Yeah. Well, Ryrie pointed out that progressive dispensationalists um, do not believe that innocence again, uh, exists, at least whenever he was writing, writing the, the book. They don't consider innocence a dispensation. Elliot Johnson does not consider it a dispensation either, but he doesn't do it on basis of sin being present. That's a different argument. Um, but yeah, just keep that in mind. The idea being is that salvation can affect your interpretation of the dispensations. Okay. And then we went back to Quiggle, which we talked about last time, right? So he's explaining right here why he wrote this book. And uh, um, he was exposed to dispensationalism, but he says right here, I discovered many books, reformed and then later dispensational. So he was already exposed to reformed stuff before he encountered dispensational things, okay? So the question I want to ask you on this relates to the title of the video, uh, The Essentials of Dispensationalism. Is soteriology a necessary part of dispensationalism, or is soteriology essential to dispensationalism? What would y'all say to that? I don't yeah, believe so. You... What, Dane? I, I don't believe so. Okay. Uh, yeah, because if so, then, then the Bible it's about salvation then well let me yeah well the bible can be about salvation but it doesn't have to be all about salvation um oh, yeah, i mean i mean I, the dispensation would, uh, i i guess i guess the way to think about this is can you have a dispensational view without having a view of sociology uh as it intersects i mean mm -hmm. okay so if you think about the different let's just let's just think of it like this all right i'm free grace right i'm free grace that's my sociology okay uh if you want to define the, the letters differently you could say i'm four point all right or i'm Aureldian. uh but we kind of gone away from this because why use the point system if you're just redefining them? So then you yeah, have you lordship. Point of this is my is my thought. And then so you have free grace dispensationalists, right? And then you have lordship salvationist dispensationalists. So this would be like your MacArthur, right? Mm -hmm. And then you got those that are yeah either five point or four point. So we'll just use the term Calvinists. Calvinistic dispensationalists. So, based and, and so, let's just first deal with this. 
Is the free grace dispensationalist really a dispensationalist? What would y'all say to that? Okay. Yes, but this, yeah, but they wouldn't necessitate salvation being part of their dispensations. Okay. So you you can hold to different views of salvation and be a dispensationalist, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now, whenever you make that statement that uh, what we're doing is we're describing what is. We're describing the reality that there are at least three systems. I mean, there's others probably that hold to dispensationalism, but you have different views of sociology. Okay, describing something is telling us, uh, it's just telling us what is. It's not prescribing mm -hmm. it. It's not saying what should be. So somebody could actually come back and say this and say, well, the only consistent view of dispensationalism is free grace. All the others are inconsistent. And therefore, like Rari makes his argument concerning uh, literal interpretation, the dis as he says, the, 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 the dispensationalist is one that consistently applies the literal interpretation. Then let's say free grace can make the argument that only free grace dispensationalists consistently apply it. And so they may make, I'm not saying they do, but they may make an argument that in that way, soteriology is essential. Mm -hmm. Because one of the arguments, yeah, right. Um, I'm just I'm just walking through this. Um, Dr. Reluctant, um, Paul Hembury, one of his objections to the term dispensationalism, even though he is a dispensationalist, is um, he prefers the term biblical covenantalism, which we've talked about before is he says that dispensationalism usually just deals with eschatology and ecclesiology, but it doesn't deal with the other aspects of systematic theology. Mm -hmm. And so he's attempted to develop that in that way. Well, Quiggle's doing the same thing, okay? Because, but uh, to understand this, we got to go back and look at what Michael Vlock said, okay? He says... He's just talking, he's right here. He says, dispensationalism is primarily concerned with the doctrines of ecclesiology and eschatology. It does not promote a specific sociological view. But, you know, there's been several books. I think Vaughn has one. I think Corey Marsh has one. I think Andy Woods has one that have made the arguments that um, dispensationalism conform, uh, continues the, um, the reformed heritage. You know, they always say always reforming and stuff. But when you interact with the reformed people, they're they're like, no. I mean, I can't I haven't found one of them to buy it yet, you know. And and and, and I'm not discounting those other books, but they're so anti-dispensational that they're not even considering that possibility. In fact, they will say, Oh, well, that's what happened is that that actually uh, the Catholics done that as part of the counter reformation, you know, they'll go into all that stuff. All right. Look what, look what um, continuity and con uh, discontinuity says right here. This is that book by Freyberg, or at least he wrote a chapter in it. He says, this was a, go ahead, Janet, you're our reader. Dispensationalism becomes very important in regard to this is ecclesiology and eschatology but it uh, but it's really not about those other areas some think salvation is at the heart of dispensationalism because they erroneously think dispensationalism teaches multiple methods multiple method of salvation why is it saying that those who properly understand the position realize its emphasis lies elsewhere yeah because the dispensations are not about salvation you know we've talked about this in other videos what jonah about his glory yeah, yeah that that's the overarching theme yes the the issue is is that there are there are people that we encounter that do teach multiple uh views of salvation that are dispensationalists but they're thrown off they're 
they're wrong. They're absolutely wrong. You know, there's some famous yeah, you, you, YouTubers that do that and they teach it wrong. And Ryries has addressed that. Other people have addressed it. But what Freiberg is saying is that uh, salvation is not even part of it, except for those people who erroneously try to make it multiple methods of salvation. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so Vlock is building off of, of what Freiberg said here. And here's Quiggle. And I have to look at the top. Uh, to, this is Quiggle. He's replying. He says the main purpose of his work, because he wrote this at the Vlock's book, is he thinks that there's four distinctives of dispensational theology. And here he's quoting Vlock, Vlock what we just read, right? Mm -hmm. And then he's and then he's going to quote him again. So basically what's happened is this is Vlock is saying uh soteriology is not one of the essentials of dispensationalism, and Quiggle in an overreaction, I would say, mm -hmm. he's trying to say, no, so, uh, uh, um, dispensationalism is a full orb uh, theology, and therefore it touches mm. on everything that a systematic theology does, or it should, it inter intersects with that. And so because of that, um, it, it explains a little bit why he stresses salvation so much in his argumentation, all right? Here's MacArthur. This is what MacArthur says, and this is quoted in 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 Vlock's book. Okay, V is Vlock, um, Q is Quiggle. Go ahead, Janet. Read right here. Uh, it comes. What? I I didn't see your mouse. My mouse. Yeah, okay. MacArthur. Yeah, maybe uh, Dane Katz chasing it. It comes to variations on other issues related to soteriology, particularly concerning Calvinism and Arminianism. Here, this read this part down here so you can see his quote. I cannot see your mouse. Where did you point out? I'm, oh, ri I'm writing. Out. That's what the red okay. is for, Janet. Go ahead. Okay. In general, I don't write. Uh, a dispensationalist who has been heavily involved in soteriological she still debates. don't see it. Right no, here. Look at look at this arrow. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, point out. So the species analysis shapes one is catology and ecclesiology. That is the extent of it. Here, what? pure dispensationalism. And so he's making the argument. So MacArthur is saying that dispensationalism only has to do with eschatology and ecclesiology. But when you study MacArthur, right, his, his main basis for his beliefs about lordship salvation come from his understanding of the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospels. And so if you're not making dispensational distinctions correctly, that can affect your view of salvation. So he can claim it all he wants, but there's a there's an interplay going on there, okay? And and he says it in this book here, Faith Works. I don't have this book. Eventually, I'll get it because it's it's referred to a lot. Andy Woods is just referring to it a lot. Um, okay, but here's the rest of what MacArthur's saying. Read it right here. He says it's oh. di pure dispensationalism has no ramifications. Go ahead. For the doctrine of God, man, sin, or sanctification, more significantly true, dispensationalism makes no relevant contribute to soteriology or the doctrine of salvation. Right. And see, you got to understand where, where MacArthur is coming from. MacArthur wants people that are reformed to be dispensationalists. Mm -hmm. I want the same thing. You know, I try to make that argument all the time, but most of them, unless they're like four pointers or Amoraldian or, or something like that, they're not going to go that far. Mm -hmm. um, at least in my experience. Um, but he's using the term peer dispensationalism. He's saying, if you're recognizing the distinctions between Israel and the church, the literal interpretation, this is not going to affect your view of salvation. You know, salvation is not part of it. 
And I'll agree with that. But if the reality is, is that how you view the text through literal interpretation affects how you understand salvation and dispensational is part of that. Mm -hmm. um, so he mentioned several different examples, right? He's talking about Ryrie here. And he's basically saying Ryrie didn't even promote, uh, um, he dealt with the issue of the charge about not multiple ways to salvation, but he didn't argue that dispensationalism leads to any particular sociological view. Okay. Uh, have you read uh, Ryrie's book, Dane? Yeah, but it was years ago okay. uh, before I had much of a background in any of this. Actually, his, his was my first dispensational book that I read. Oh, wow. That's a challenge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so basically, he's got a chapter called um, Salvation in Dispensationalism. He's got Ecclesiology in Dispensationalism, Eschatology in Dispensationalism. He's going through the different ologies as it relates to that. And he's, he's mainly dealing with the abuses and the misrepresentations and things like that. I see. Um, but I think Ryrie wanted people to be dispensationalists, even if they were uh, not free grace, even if they were lordship, because DTS started out Presbyterian, L.S. Schaefer, you know, DTS is non-denominational. And, and so what I think's kind of happened is DTS wanted to hold on to dispensationalism but they, but they let soteriology slip or they left it open mm. in that area. And then that kind of affected other uh, interpretations later on, you know. Um, so he's mentioning some progressive dispensationalists here and uh, um, Blazing, uh, Bach, and a couple others, okay? He's mm -hmm. basically trying to say none of them have made salvation the essential for dispensationalism, okay? So here is Quiggle, right? And uh, look what Quiggle says here. Go ahead, Janet, read. Right here, what the pink is. Still, uh, still other others believe Reformed theology consistently uses the same hermeneutics or, or interpretative method. Dispensationalism consistently uses it doesn't. Okay, let me explain. Ryrie was making the argument that everybody uses literal interpretation, but only the dispensationalist uses it different, uh, uh, consistently. Mm -hmm. And so by saying that, they're saying we all use the same inter uh, hermeneutic, okay? But he's saying, he's saying no. He seems to be on the idea of, of dispensationalism being a hermeneutic rather than a mm -hmm. theology, you know? Mm -hmm. and there's a debate about that. You know, most people would say it's a theology, not a hermeneutic. Because What's the difference, you, by the way? Can you differentiate? Yeah. If, if, if something is a hermeneutic, it's how you interpret the Bible, okay? It's the process. It's it's the principles, science of interpreting uh but if it's a theology, then that's the results from the Bible. It's your conclusions. Okay. So either the procedure or the, the result of following the procedure. Right. Is that it's, what you're saying? Yeah. The interpret mm -hmm. hermeneutics would be the procedure and the, the theology would be built off of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, the here. Quiggle's basically saying uh, Vlock was incorrect. He does not argue that dispensationalism inherently leads to any particular sociological view. He says Vlock is incorrect like that because Ryrie contributed a lot about the content of faith aspect of things. But me having read Ryrie, I don't think I can get that from this argument right here. This is just where Ryrie is just saying the basis of salvation in every age is the death of Christ. The requirement of salvation in every age is faith. The object of, is, is God and so on like that. And the content of faith changes in various dispensations. So Ryrie's dealing with the issue of salvation being the same in every dispensation. 
but he's not saying that you have to have a certain sociological belief in order in order to be a dispensationalist. Okay. But remember this, Ryrie also said you don't have to believe in pre-trib and be a dispensationalist. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. I think Ryrie believed that uh, it happens already. What do you mean? It, uh, I mean, the, 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 Rapture in Revelation, it happens already. No, uh, Rari, no, Rari's, Rari's uh, pre trib, not preterist. Uh, uh, no, no, it's uh, okay, it's RC Sproul. Yeah, Sproul, yeah, 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 Sproul. Um, <laughs> yeah, different R. Um, so Rari basically says, and I'd have to find this quote, but he's saying mm -hmm. that. If you're consistent, then yeah, you would end up being pre-trib. Mm -hmm. But that, but you can be a dispensationalist and be pre-millennial, but your view of the rapture does not determine whether you're dispensationalist or not. Mm -hmm. I, I just say it determines what whether you're consistent or not, you know. And I think it's sort of like this issue with salvation as well. So he's saying uh, it doesn't require a certain soteriological view, but if you're consistent, it'll naturally come to the same. Rari never, Rari never said those words about salvation. He doesn't say that, but he okay. seems to say that almost about uh, the rapture. Okay. Okay. Um, but you see where I'm going <laughs> about you mm -hmm. know uh, because uh, the because that's what Vlock is saying. Well, they didn't make it an issue. And Quiggle's like, no, they've made statements, you know, about this. And Quiggle's like, well, let me take it further. Let me show you how much salvation is involved here. And he, he goes too far, um, I think. All right, go ahead, Janet. Start reading right here. Okay, I'm sorry. I know what this is. So he quotes Ryrie quoting the uh, Article 5 of the DTS statement. Okay, about the dispensations and stuff, in which I have right here. Okay, and I don't know if you can see that. So what I want to do? Can you can you see that, Janet? Yes. Go ahead, read that. This is from the DTS site. My goodness, I need to do this. <laughs> we believe that the dispensations are not ways of salvation, nor did method of administrating the so-called covenant of grace. They are not in themselves dependent on covenant relationship, but are ways of life and responsibility to God, which tests the submission of man to his revealed will during a particular time. We believe that if man does trust in his own effort to gain the favor of God of salvation. Charlie, I heard the effort again. God of salvation under any dispensational test because of an inherent sin, his failure to satisfy fully the just judgments, uh, requirements, as you say, of God is inevitable and his condemnation sure. So you can hear where they're saying, look, we're not saying there's multiple ways of salvation. And we're saying that regardless if you're talking about salvation or any type of gain in favor with God, man is eventually going to fail. And, um, and then go ahead, keep reading. Uh, we believe that according to the eternal purpose of God in Ephesians 3.11, salvation in the divine recalling is always by grace through him and rests upon the basis of the shed blood of Christ. We believe that God has always been gracious regardless of the ruling dispensation, but that man has not at all times been under on, uh, under an administration. Un administration or 
stewardship of grace as it is true in the presence in the present dispensation first Corinthians okay now this part down here uh, I think I actually have it in another slide basically what it's saying is we believe that the, the uh, however we believe that it's historically impossible that they should have had a conscious object of their faith the incarnate crucified son so while they're saying salvation is the same in every dispensation they're saying that we didn't know the same thing about the object of faith. And that's significant because right here, they're basically coming out against covenant theology here. Mm -hmm. And they're mm -hmm. coming out against covenant theology down here. Mm -hmm. But they're doing it in such a subtle way um, that it allows for them to hold the progressive dispensationalism and things like that. Um, but my point is, is that this itself is a soteriological statement. So when they're describing mm -hmm. the dispensations, they're already having to qualify, you know, the soteriology involved here. Can I ask something about this? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I got the answer, but yeah. <laughs> well, it, it seems to me that they're, they're looking at the covenants as if they are um, more soteriological than they are. For example, uh, it says that it's not dependent on the covenant relationship. Now that, that could be fellowship that they're referencing, but if they're putting it in the context of salvation, are they dislocating covenants from dispensations because they view the covenants as? Well, even though people talk about the suzerain vassal treaties and all of this, mm -hmm. I don't, and I'm going to say this, and I may be going out on a limb and saying this, but mm -hmm. I don't think that the, the idea of covenants not being a salvation category was addressed until I addressed it, you know? Okay. Mm -hmm. I, but I will say, I think Charles Clough came really close to saying what I'm saying, you know? So, uh, so I think that's an issue that, that a lot of Christianity has. Is they're assuming mm -hmm. there's some is, that the covenants are soteriological, right? And that's fine if it if you want to use it in a broad sense, but whenever you're mm -hmm. dealing with individually, I think you run into some issues there. Yeah, because um, I, I mean, in a way, the covenants are soteriological, but always consistently with that trace of the proto evangel evangelium where we're waiting for that seed. The, yeah, the, for example, the Abrahamic and the Mosaic don't have different forms of salvation involved in them. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that some more in the covenants, but I'm glad you're already thinking about that because okay. it's going to make that conversation so much easier when we get there. Okay. okay. So much difficult for me. Yeah. I was supposed to ask also, what's the difference between covenant and dispensational? Okay. Well, <laughs> Early on, in, early on in our first video, I'll go ahead and mark up this page. Early up in our first video, we, we drew that we had the seven dispensations at the bottom of the screen. And then we had an overarching like rainbow thing and it said the glory of God, mm -hmm. okay? Where covenant theology, they would say you got the covenant of works, which is in the garden. And then you have the covenant of grace and then you have the covenant of redemption and the covenant of redemption is this idea that God the Father and the Son made an agreement that uh, who all the elect would be and who all would be saved. And therefore, because they're viewing everything from that perspective of election and redemption, they think that the covenants and the dispensations are, are an outworking of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. okay. I think some of my slides got mixed up here, but I'll try to work with what I got here. I, th um, I think Larkin defines the covenant. Uh, he defines it as a contract between God and man for um, fellowship. Mm -hmm. But uh, he also makes a note that each new covenant opens a new dispensation. And I haven't looked into that enough to, to agree with him. Or well, to that's cool that him. he used the word fellowship there. I mean... Yeah. yeah, Dane's YouTube video just uploaded recently. It's talk about that a little bit, mm -hmm. right? Cool. Yeah, I didn't go far enough to quote where he talks about the fellowship in that quote, um, but he he seems to 
separate soteriology from the covenants. So is dispensationalist of marriage the, the, the covenant? Yes, but there's, there's, if you remember, and maybe you're trying to get answers to your questions for major Bible themes, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, Chafer and Walbert, they talk about that there's three theological covenants, the covenant mm -hmm. of grace, the covenant of works, and the covenant of redemption. And he makes a distinction between theological covenants, what they believe are, are um, not taught in the text. You know, they're, they're Implicit. inferred. Yeah. And, and then there's what are called biblical covenants, where it's the Bible calls them covenants. Mm -hmm. And so there are dispensationalists that believe in the theological covenants, but also the biblical covenants. And there's non-dispensationalists that believe in them, but also believe in the others as well. So what makes a person a dispensationalist is not what kind of covenant you believe in. It has to do with, um, you know, literal interpretation, a distinction between Israel and uh, if you want to say the glory of God. That, mm -hmm. but, but Vlach is offering more involved here, okay? I'm missing some slides, I think, here, but let me just look here. Um, Messianic salvation extending to believing Gentiles. He's saying this is taught in scripture. Salvation by grace through faith alone. Um, so this is where he's addressing the content stuff. So I felt like Quiggle was too harsh on Block, honestly. Um, so he's continues on and, and he's quoting from Rari and, and uh, here is Rari, okay? Mm -hmm. Listen, what Rari's this is this is uh, Rari quoting the uh, the DTS uh, thing. All right, that salvation is always by grace, which I should have had Janet read it. My slides are mixed up though, but right here. However, we believe that it was historically impossible that they should have as the conscious object of their faith the incarnate crucified Son, the Lamb of God that it is evident that they did not comprehend as we do that sacrifices depict the person and the work of Christ. So that's where they're saying that there's no way that Adam and Eve and others understood what we understand in light of progressive revelation. Okay, so this is back to Quiggle. Okay. Go ahead, Janet, read that. A latter chapter. Dispensational, dispensationalism has more to contribute to theology. Re read the pink. I'm sorry. Read the pink, please. It's fine. The contributions of dispensational theology are in the areas of hermeneutics, the interpretation of the Bible, soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, is ecclesiology, the doctrine of the New Testament, church, and eschatology, the doctrine of last thing. Yeah, so he's just basically saying is that dispensationalism has more to do with theology than just a study of the church and end times. Um, so Quiggle is going to call himself a traditional, classical, or essential dispensationalist. I haven't heard the term essential dispensationalist until recently. Jacob Paro wrote a book um, where he's arguing for that, but it's what you, Rari called normative or, or whatever, but it's based off the sine qua nons of Rari, okay? So um, here's that book by uh, Jake, uh, Joseph, I'm sorry, wrong, wrong Bible character, Joseph Paro, <laughs> Dispensational Development and Departure. This just came out, I haven't read it yet, but I've listened to his, his, his interview with Paul Miles uh, oh, I watched. Did you watch that one, Janet? Okay. Yeah, I think that, yeah. All right. So remember, Quiggle is saying that the dispensation of innocence is not a dispensation because sin has to be involved, right? Um, he's bringing up his ob objections here. We kind of dealt with this in the last video. Um, he's basically saying that you, in order for a management to exist, there has to be a crisis. Uh, so, well, going back into Vlock, right? Vlock starts talking about some books that have come out against dispensationalism that are not been fair 
This is one by uh, Gershner, Wrongly Divided the Word of Truth, a critique on dispensationalism. Rari dealt with a lot of this one as well, I think. But uh, uh, I haven't read this particular book, but I have read uh, um, Matheson's, which has a similar title. I have read this book by Hannah Graff, and this is before he converted to orthodoxy, where he's just bashing dispensationalists, making us all look weird and, and all of that. Um, this is that one I told you I've read, uh, Rightly Dividing the People of God by Matheson, just attacking dispensationalists in unfair ways, you know? And so when Vlock's writing, Vlock is kind of addressing some of those issues. And so Vlock mentions, uh, Vlock mentions this book, uh, this person right here, okay? Kim Riddlebarger, you ever heard of that name, Dane? No, I haven't. Okay, uh, she wrote a book, or he wrote a book uh, uh, called uh, The Case for Amillennialism. I have not read it yet, but recently in discussions with some Lutherans and some other Reformed people, they are referring back to this book. But he's, Vlock is right here saying is that Riddlebarker is recognizing the ungracefulness tone in Hannah Graff's book. So it's like, Somebody that is not a dispensationalist is even recognizing that. I see. All right. Now, what what Vlock is pointing out right here is a real Barker believes in a reinterpretation of Old Testament eschatology. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> this is one of the issues where while Vlock does not think just saying we believe in a literal interpretation is good enough. Because the issue really is not literal interpretation. The issue is, is which priority do you place on the Old Testament and New Testament? Do you start with the New Testament and read it into the Old? Or do you start with the Old and read forward? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so he's quoting these different people, you know, about that issue right there. And uh, it deals with the... They, Covenant theologians typically have a New Testament priority. They start with the New Testament before. Now, I first encountered this. There's that book I told you about. Um, well, whenever I've, I've seen that book. Oh, yeah? We sold that at the bookstore I worked at. Okay. Um, I'm yeah, yeah, it was in the, the discount case. dial. I don't think anyone ever bought it. <laughs> but if I, have to, if I ever have to write a paper on that particular issue, I'm, that's one book mm -hmm. I'm going to interact with because that's the one yeah. they're bringing up. I believe that whenever we do our you know, research and study that we should interact with the strongest arguments, the best presentation, not the worst. Right. Um, yeah. So this is a book I, I read a while back and uh, it first uh, jailed with the issue of priority in New Testament. So basically, you got three main approaches, okay? You got what's called the canonical approach or New Testament priority school. So basically, they, they start with the New Testament as their starting point. They think about Jesus, pretty much. And they basically say, well, the, well this divine author from the New Testament clarifies what the human intent was in the Old Testament. All right? Mm -hmm. So they're basically putting on their Jesus glasses and reading that, you know, and that's why the DTS statement was saying there's no way that they understood what we understood about Jesus. So that's a, a view that it's not good. Yeah, the, it seems like it's telling just to, you know, seems to be right, but the, not really depending on what it is, solid foundation. The um, Right. Now, this is uh, my view. Uh, this is uh, Elliot Johnson explaining this, I think. But basically what happens is this, is when you're reading the Old Testament, you see a rosebud or a seed or a, a promise, right? And you find out what the, what the meaning is in, in that book at that time. And so then you read and you trace progressive revelation and you start to get an idea of, of the sense of what the, the divine author knows and reveals over time, okay? Then you start recognizing, oh, wow, that rose turned into a, uh, that bloom turned into a full-blown rose. And so that helps us understand that. But the difference is, is that the meaning doesn't change. The New Testament doesn't change the meaning of the Old Testament, okay? So we're not reading meaning into the Old Testament. We're 
finding the meaning and then we're tracing the uh, the unfolding of it. Mm. You understand, Janet? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, this is the other view that I think DTS has been largely influenced by, even though they reject the first one, which is more towards covenant theology. This is one that I think that they, and even people, uh, you know, that are not DTS, but are in our camp have fallen into, I think. And I try to be careful of this. Basically what happens is this, is they say, okay, here's a New Testament author. Let's say it's Paul or something, right? Well, Paul is a rabbi and Paul or, or, you know, or he's thinking and arguing in the same way that they argued during the intertestamental times, which is called Pecture Exegesis where he's using midrash type arguments. And so basically they're saying, well, Paul can do this with the text. And so therefore we can too. So what they do is they try to say, well, Paul, what really he's doing is he's really uncovering the human intent of the Old Testament when he makes that argument. So you, you get what's going on here, Dane? Yeah. Uh, basically using intertestamental and uh, hermeneutics uh, to try to say that Paul's doing this because mm -hmm. this basically breaks down the distinction between Israel and the church. I mean, uh, some try to maintain it, but this is where it has that issue. So when I was at the Chafer conference, I talked to Steve Gare about that particular issue, Pastor Exegesis, and people can go back and watch that, uh, that series of 2019. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Vlock called, you know, he's talking about these essential beliefs of dispensationalism, right? And uh, he mentioned that that Freeberg in that continuity and discontinuity, he mentioned six different things, all right? Janet, go ahead and read these six. Where is it? Right here. One. Okay. Two. In, in 1988, with his important chapter, System of Discontinuity, John um, no, offered six essentials of dispensationalism. One, believe that the Bible refers to multiple senses of terms like Jew and seed of Abraham. Two, an approach to hermeneutics that emphasizes that the Old Testament be taken on its own terms and not reinterpreted in light of the New Testament. Three, believe that Old Testament promises will be fulfilled with national Israel. Four, fourth, believe in a distinctive future for ethnic Israel. Five, believe that the church is a distinctive organism and six philosophy of history that emphasizes not just soteriologic, soteriological and spiritual issue but social economic and political issue as well so i was saying freeberg but this is feinberg i think it's how you say it so from these six um Vlock, based on his studies, is going to come up with his essentials of dispensationalism. And they're not as easy to remember as Ryrie's sine qua nons, but we're going to try. Okay. So here's that chapter in Feinberg, what he called them, essentials of dispensationalism. Page 67. Now, he also points out that Bach, who's a progressive dispensationalist, these are the ones he held to. Go ahead, Janet, read those. Um, common features of dispensationalism. Of oh, this one, blue one. Yeah, the these blue features one. Include, these features included one, the authority of scripture, two, dispensations, three, uniqueness of the church, four, practical significance of the universal church, five, fifth, significance of biblical prophecy, six, futurist premillennialism, seven, imminent return of Christ, eight, the national future of Israel. So what Vlock is going to start doing is he's going to say, okay, Ryrie said this, 
Vlock said th- I mean, uh, uh, Bach said this, uh, Blazing said this. And so these people that uh, we're going to come up with these essentials that both that that are both inside of normative dispensationalism or what uh, Quiggle calls essential dispensationalism and progressive dispensationalism. Because Vlock, in the very beginning, he says that he's somewhere in between a norm, uh, what I can't remember, but it's talking about traditional dispensationalism and a progressive dispensationalist. Okay. Andy Woods here calls him a progressive dispensationalist in the kingdom. Yeah. In the kingdom. Yeah. Um, he tries, basically, he says this he says, I don't see the Davidic kingdom in an existence in any type of way. So I don't, yeah. So yeah. Uh, Vlock is is agreeing that the kingdom, the Davidic kingdom, is not in existence right now. It's not. It's not in existence yet. Mm-hmm. Where other progressive dispensationalists say they were. So the issue, the issue with the issue with Vlock is, if he's a progressive dispensationalist, he's he's a progressive dispensationalist under some other criteria than the one that Ryrie laid out in dispensationalism. And I don't know if Dr. Woods goes into uh, that in in that book or where we can find that because um, if he's a progressive dispensationalist and we have to evaluate that and we're going to talk about all those systems later on in the future. But yeah, I I just think that does go ahead. It it does have to do with his view of um, the church and the kingdom is what. Andy Woods is describing as his uh, okay. progressive leanings. Okay, yeah. Um, and he doesn't see a literal 1,000 years either. Bach doesn't. Vlock or Bach? Bach. Oh, you're talking about Bach. Yeah. I'm I, talking I, about Bach. Okay, all right. See, that's confusing. <laughs> B, it, v it is, and B, okay? <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. So Vlad does not see a literal millennium. Right, right, right. Now, now I'm with you. Yes, you're right. So okay. I, I hopefully. So yes. I don't think he mentions Vlock in this book. Yeah, Bach. Bach, of course, believes that the kingdom is already in, in effect, yeah. but not yeah. yet. So this is what we got on. V, Mr. Vlock, is writing about Ryrie, Bach, and Blazing. Okay. And he's yes, trying to yeah. say, wh- what are some essential things that we can bring together from, from their descriptions of dispensationalism, all right? This is Blazing's book, Progressive Dispensationalism. Um, look, what, look what Vlock does right here. He says, but he's talking about the glory of God idea, Rari. He said, but human salvation is part of God's broader kingdom purposes. So Vlock is saying uh, that when we're talking about salvation, it needs to be assumed underneath the concept of the kingdom. So it looks like, and I'm not sure if that's right, it looks like then rather than the, being the glory of the God, that he has the kingdom as the overarching concept, which he has written a book on the kingdom. So, um, mm-hmm. okay, look what, look what uh, Vlock says right here. Go ahead, Janet, read I, that right there. I personally do not bring up the glory of God as a distinguishing characteristic of dispensational theology. Yeah, so so Vlock is saying, I don't include that one. Hmm. Um, Why? <laughs> well, keep reading. Uh, which one? The pink one? No, read, read, no. Finberg keep reading means continue. More yeah, right precise there. Precise when he pointed out that dispensationalists have adopted a, a philosophy of history that is more holistic and emphasizes more the spiritual and physical implications of eschatology than non dispensationalists often do. Dispensationalists, especially. Uh, emphasize the, con- the complete and literal fulfillment of both the spiritual and physical promises of the biblical covenant. So it sounds like Vlock is saying that he's more focused on the spiritual and physical promises 
of the biblical mm -hmm. covenants being fulfilled. And of course, that relates to the kingdom program. Yeah. So he he's basically saying there's everyone believes in the glory of God. Mm -hmm. You know, now while it's true that the covenant theologian uh, relates everything to salvation, uh, they also emphasize the glory of God. And so he's like saying, well, there's no reason for us to emphasize the glory of God uh, as a distinguishing factor. And so if that's true, then um, then um, why bring it up? You know, I see. I see. So what do y'all think? Do y'all think the glory of God is a, a distinguishing factor of dispensationalism? I think it's an integral part of it, but perhaps, like you said, not a distinguishing factor. And and the other thing is this, is and I mentioned this whenever Janet and I were going through this video, is I realized that when Ryrie was talking about the glory of God, he wasn't talking about eternity past and eternity future. He was talking about the glory of God realized in the millennial kingdom when Christ mm -hmm. is ruling and fulfillment of the covenants. Right. So if, if you if you do that, then that would distinguish it. At least you would have premillennial covenantalism that could possibly believe in that, but it would distinguish it like that. But just saying the glory of God doesn't make very much of a distinction, you know. Right. And yet, whenever I preached the other day, I made the statement: the big idea of the Bible is the glory of God. That's how I started this series, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the reason like, being, go ahead, Dane. Oh, sorry, I, I just, um, I've had conversations with a few covenant theo theology people, and uh, they hang on those terms, glory of God, and the term also biblicist, mm -hmm. uh, because they, they, they're offended by our use of that as a distinguishing factor, because, and, and they, they don't really want to listen to an argument beyond that. So I've, I've, tried to work around those words because you recognize that they also uh, they hold scripture in high regard and they hold the glory of God in high regard uh, but their outworking of how that influences their interpretation of other passages is different right and, and that's why I wanted to discuss Vlock's um, essentials right here because it's going to help us understand uh the deeper issues of dispensationalism as we're going through interacting with Ryrie and other people um, mm -hmm. early on. So don't say, oh, Charlie Foss taught me about the glory of God <laughs> being the overarching theme of the Bible. Don't get me wrong. I still believe that the glory of God is the overarching theme of the Bible. I just mm -hmm. can't say that that is the distinguishing factor of dispensationalism. Right. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. So that makes a Rari sine qua non rather than three being two. Normal literal interpretation, which leads to a distinction between Israel and the church. But then you think about it like this, well, that's literal interpretation, like Janet was saying. So if yes. you interpret Israel literal, then that, so really, do you- Just one. <laughs> if, yeah, if, if you consistently use the literal hermeneutic in all passages of scripture, that makes you a dispensationalist. So yeah, yep. it's just one. Um, well, is it is it Ryrie who says anyone who sees the distinction between Israel and the church is by their by nature a dispensationalist? He mentions about like the sacrifices and things like that, mm -hmm. if I remember right. So yeah, there is that argument, but the thing is that they don't consistently see it. There's some people that would yeah. see it in the Old Testament, but like you mentioned about the progressive dispensationalists, mm -hmm. they don't see that distinction in the millennium. Yes, right. So. Yeah, I, I, I think the, uh, what Ryrie said was, if you worship on Sunday instead of Saturday. Yeah. Uh, I think that was the reference he made. Yeah, those are dispensational distinctions. Yeah. And, and it's, it's weird. You can make dispensational distinctions, but not be a dispensationalist. Yeah. And I think that was just his attention grabber um, near the beginning of his book. Yeah. So Vok with the V, he's mm -hmm. looking at Ryrie. He's looking at Feinberg. He's looking at Blazing. He's looking at Bach. And he's basically mm -hmm. saying, what are these things that I could see throughout? 
And and he's he, what's interesting is he argues that Acts two is a common factor. So he's assuming right. that uh, Acts two dispensationalism is yeah. is the way to go. And I believe that you know, mm -hmm. but you got people nowadays mid Acts, you know, uh, yeah. post Acts or however you want to say that that uh, don't believe in that. So. Here's the church that came in existence, the uniqueness of the church. That's mm -hmm. the first one. Okay. Do y'all agree with that? Do y'all believe that the church is unique? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Number two, that there's a future for, for Israel. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that's true. But this is the thing. There's a lot of people that believe that there's a future for Israel. But what they yeah. mean is that there's going to be some Jews that get saved. Mm-hmm. But what the dispensationalist means is that, no, they're going to get the land and fulfillment of the covenants. Christ is going to rule on earth for a thousand years. You know, the resurrected saints, you know, all that stuff. Okay. National Israel. That's, that's another point that covenant theologians have pushed back hard against is, uh, is that idea of a national Israel. Right. Uh, they really don't like that. And because yeah. they just think about salvation. They think about the elect. Yeah of all yep. ages you're the elect yep. or you're not yeah okay um but see he vlogs pointing out that it's talking about israel being in leadership and in service to other nations there's specific mm -hmm. prophecies okay and then both ryrie and feinberg mentioned a third dispensational approach to hermeneutics uh so he's talking about consistent interpretation but look what feinberg a saying right here about Rari. Go ahead, Janet, read. To simply, to simply stick in stating the matter this way, according to what Feinberg, yeah. the issue of hermeneutics is not an easy issue. And he points out that many non-dispensational theologians claim to interpret the Bible literally. Okay, now let's talk about this. When we're talking about a claim, we're describing what is. It is it's it's possible for a person to have illogical beliefs, yeah. right? I mean, um, it, a person can believe in unconditional election, but also say, well, I don't see it taught in scripture. I, it, rather, it's more of a logical deduction or something. Mm -hmm. um, it's possible for that. And they could say, well, I believe in an unconditional election, but I don't accept the rest of Tula. It's right. possible that you can find somebody that's being logically inconsistent for a system, but that isn't saying what should be. And so the issue is, is that are we going to allow the non-dispensationalists to determine our terms and to determine what makes us a dispensationalist? If our claim is that the dispensationalist is the only one that's consistent in his use of the literal interpretation, if that claim is true, then I don't have a problem uh, arguing for that. Do y'all? Mm -hmm. no. So regardless of other people using literal interpretation, we can always say they're not doing it consistently. Mm -hmm. So I'm still holding on to this, okay? Um, mm -hmm. Even though it may seem too simplistic, um, uh, I do think it needs to be included that just because of, it's possible for a person not to be consistent with their own beliefs. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. This is what we were talking about earlier. Read this, Janet, about Feinberg. According to Feinberg, the difference between dispensational and non-dispensational hermeneutics is found in three areas. One, the relation of the progress of revelation to the priority of one testament over the other. Two, the understanding and implication of the New Testament use of the Old Testament. And three, the understanding and implications of typology. So he's saying that's really what's going on concerning our issue of hermeneutics. Is, mm -hmm. uh, what, go ahead, Janet. No, I'm thinking, should be when you read the Bible, even though, you know, there's something like it's kind of, it, I mean, the typology, 
Is it necessary to do it when you read the Bible, when you uh, grammatically or, you know? Well, it depends what you mean by typology. I think a lot of what Block is calling typology is just the idea that Israel had a job and now Israel has been temporarily set aside. So the church is described as having the same job, mm. you know. Israel is supposed to be a light to the Gentiles, right? Now the church is a light. Yeah. yeah. It's like uh, yeah. the focus now is church and then Israel is set aside and then during yes, the temporarily, time, yes. They will focus again on the Jews, something like that. Right. And going back to picture exegesis and also this use of the Old Testament, that's the problem is, you know, uh, a lot of scholarship has been gone into this issue right here of how the old, the New Testament is using the old, uh, the old Testament. And I try to take a conservative view as possible with that. And uh, other people don't necessarily do that. And I, I may be wrong to do it, but... It's what I'm attempting to do because I'm just so leery of this right here. Um, so I do think, so when we put all these six together, right? Basically, they are one. Go ahead, Janet, read it. One, the primary meaning of any Bible passage is found in the passage. Right. Huh? <laughs> what? The primary meaning, the primary meaning of any Bible passage is found in that passage. The Go ahead, New read the, yeah. The New Testament does not reinterpret or transcend Old Testament passages in a way that overrides or cancels the original authority, authority, authorial intent of the Old Testament writers. So Vlock is saying that if you're going, here's essential beliefs that he believes are foundational. Uh, He's saying you got to recognize this first, that the that you find the, the meaning of a passage is in that passage. You know, the book was given, the book of Genesis was given as a whole, you know, and you need to understand that first. And 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 no New Testament passage is going to change what's in the Old Testament. Okay. Mm. He's saying you can't be a dispensationalist if you don't believe that. All right, because all the other systems, what they do is they uh, they do that. They say the New Testament shows the meaning. You know, something's changed. So he's saying that progressive revelation is a key tenet of dispensationalism. Or yeah. Of- yes, but it's mm-hmm. more about the see where it says right here the starting point. Okay. So you start with the meaning of that passage and move forward. Mm-hmm. All right. So, so yeah, everybody believes in progressive revelation, but it's but a lot of times what you find out is they're assuming uh, mm-hmm. uh, that the New Testament passage is where you start because you already know that. You start right. with church age truth and then you mm-hmm. read backwards. That seems to be what Gabeline quite often does. Uh, when he's allegorizing some of the Old Testament narrative. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you think Vlock, I don't know how well you know, but do you think Vlock would would say that Gabeline is not a dispensationalist because of his uh, reading the New Testament into the Old constantly? I don't think, I don't think um, Vlock is attempting to say, this is what excludes you from being a dispensationalist. Okay. And he's just basically saying there's these essential beliefs that I've found, you mm-hmm. know, um, like I said, he's trying to harmonize these yeah. different systems that, uh, you know, yeah. that are articulated things. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. So I, 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 don't, I don't think he would reject them, but he would probably say he was not consistent, you know. Okay. Yeah. But That's the thing fair. about dispensationalism, you got to recognize the pioneers, the pioneers, mm-hmm. Typically, what I mean, there's two trends you basically see with the pioneers, and, and everybody's a pioneer to a certain age, um, for a certain age, is you have this idea, okay, they see distinctions, mm-hmm. and then there's times where they're inconsistent, you yeah. know, 
and so they 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 were you're trying to iron you out know, the wrinkle yeah because i mean you got okay i'm seeing these distinctions in text but also there's continuity in the text and i got to minister mm -hmm. to my audience and i got to preach and so i need to relate the truth to the rapture and so maybe yeah. i'll use the noah in the ark as an example you know or and and it, it confuses people but they yeah. don't intend yeah. to do that I, I think i i just did that on friday in our study but <laughs> i i made the point that it's not typological of the rapture it just happens to be um a sim god similar way of um mm -hmm. salvation and judgment yeah you're but you're making the distinction you're saying what's similar and what's different exactly and that's all it is and yeah the gable line goes a little too far sometimes in saying this is what the text meant mm -hmm. um yeah okay so I, I think i understand block's argument and see that that's the good thing about what we're doing right now it should make us more careful students mm -hmm. we appreciate the contribution of other people but it should make us more careful right um okay ba check this out this is what rari said and and i forgot about this quote but i thought it's pretty mm -hmm. good go ahead janet read that um, Ryder said God would have to be conceived of us deceiving the Old Testament prophets when he revealed to them a nationalistic kingdom. Since he would have known all the time that he would completely reverse the concept in latter revelation. Yeah. So if, if it's true that the meaning uh, changed or whatever and that Israel has been replaced, then you would have to have God deceiving a person. And this argument mm -hmm. works the same way for eternal security. Why would God tell a person that they're saved in scripture and then you find out later on that they reversed it through loss of salvation, mm -hmm. you know? Right. All right, so number two that makes someone a dispensationalist or that is essential to dispensationalism is, is right here. Go ahead, read Janet. Mm -hmm. uh, types exist but national israel is not an inferior type that is superseded by the church right so it's he's saying i'm not denying that there are types in the bible you know between israel and the church but that doesn't mean that the church has replaced israel mm -hmm. um like i said the, the thing about connections and stuff like i said a lot of it has to do with just the idea that is that the church is now doing Israel's job right. in certain areas. Okay, number three. Israel and the church are distinct. Thus, the church cannot be identified as the new and or true Israel. So what we see, if we go back, right? The primary meaning, this has to do with literal interpretation. Mm -hmm. number two about the types that has to do with literal interpretation mm -hmm. then number three deals with the distinction between israel and the church that comes from literal interpretation four go ahead janet spiritual unity in salvation between jews and gentiles is compatible with a future functional role for israel as a nation so basically what he's saying is just because salvation is the same in every dispensation, there's still a future national hope for Israel that goes beyond just people being saved that are Jews, but they're going to have a function. They're going to rule, you know, they're going to reign. They're going to, uh, you know, they're going to function as a nation. Okay. So Can even, even. Well, the Gentiles in Israel are going to be distinct, but the issue is, is that when Jesus rules over the world from Israel, the Gentiles are going to come up to Israel, you know, the Gentile nations. Yeah, but but it's just it's also that the the Israel you know rule over the Gentiles. Yes, during that time, yeah, because Jesus mm -hmm. is going to rule, and then the Old Testament saints and and so on. So yes. Israel will be on top again. And through them, the whole world is blessed. Yes. It's not a domination, but a blessing through. Yeah. 
Um, so there's no Gentiles over Israel as the biblical. Uh, no, the Gentiles are over Israel right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in the, this is called the, the time of the Gentiles we're living in right now. No, uh, what I'm trying to say is in the eternal state. Well, we're not. This is about the like, millennium. Uh, so huh? you mean like church? Uh, this is about yeah. the millennium. Yeah. I, I know, I know, I know. But my, my point is, if we if we are, if Jesus rule over, right? And then, uh, is that the Israel is over also the Gentiles? During the millennium, yes. Mm -hmm. But what about the eternal state? That's not what I'm trying to say. There's distinctions there, but um, yeah, the distinction is the distinction is the the Israel is over the Gentiles. The Gentile is just there always, even this time. Well, see that. Well, well, the, the difference is with the eternal state is everybody has glorified bodies. Mm -hmm. In the millennium, they're just humans. I know, I know. But I want uh, what the Bible said. If we are in the in the eternal state, is the rule is just the 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 the, the Israel, but the Gentile is still underneath of the Israel, even in the eternal state is there's nothing fair or the fair is just the fair is just the the we have the you know uh glorified body that's the only Dispen dispens thing. dispensations have to do with how god rules this earth mm -hmm. the eternal state is a new heaven and new earth okay yeah yeah mm. So the distinctions are there, but the issue far as about domination and stuff, I don't think they're necessary. You understand? Yeah. Uh, the chain of command far as about Israel oh, being over the Gentiles in the eternal state, I don't think that's the, the issue. Um, mm -hmm. Then again, I don't know, Janet. I mean, we may come to that and we may study it out. But mm -hmm. the, point, the point is, is that he's making the argument here that israel is going to have a functional role it's just not about them being saved they're going to be doing yeah. something as a nation yeah that's uh, i know mm -hmm. that's is given already but i'm asking about how about the gentiles you know? i understand we, but that that's the eternal state i'm not ready to deal with the eternal state right now it's uh the only reason we've talked about the eternal state was number one, to determine whether it was a dispensation. Number two, it's comparison with eternity past and, mm -hmm. uh, and all of that. But the eternal state is last for a reason. You know, I mean, it's probably one of the most difficult things to depict because as far as I know, we only have one chapter that talks about it and maybe a little yeah. bit of Isaiah and, you know, so. <laughs> I, I, I will wait. What did Andy Wood say about it when he taught a revelation? Uh, he talks about the uh, merging of the Davidic throne with uh, God's yeah. throne, so uh, that yeah, the Davidic throne, Revelation twenty one, yeah, has the promise of um, eternity. He oh. doesn't go into it much more than that. And that's probably because of the sparse uh, or paucity of scriptural reference to it. I mean, yeah. it's referenced, but not really explicated in the text for us that much. Yeah. Um, Dillo may actually talk about it some. I'd have to look. Yeah. Um, and another guy named Martin Culley, who uh, interacts mm -hmm. and he's got some weird beliefs. He probably talks about it as well because he goes into the outer darkness ideas and all of that. But I don't Is know, he, Janet. I would have to get he into lists, that. He yeah, lists, I will wait. Or, I will wait until we we were going to the last part of the eternal state is the last dispensation, right? Yeah. If it's a dispensation. <laughs> he lists four transitional things. He says... Um, is this Jeremy or who? This is uh, Woods. Okay. Uh, but he, this is more talking about the transition between millennium and the kingdom that Satan's final deception and rebellion destruction of satan's rebellious forces 
And then the final separation, removal of everything unfit for the eternal kingdom. And then everything is made new. Um, and he talks about the ex nihilo mm. new creation. Um, that's about as much as he says about it. He really doesn't go into it mm. much. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 and so, Janet, we may be in uncharted territory there. We'll do the best to answer your questions. But um, if not, God will take care of them when we get there. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Okay, number five. Go ahead, the read, nation, Janet. The nation Israel will be both saved and restored with a unique function, a role in a future earthly millennial kingdom. Okay, that almost sounds the same. Yeah. So this one is focusing on the salvation. And then this focuses on their role. I think you could probably merge those two together. Um, yeah. well, right. As you've been pointing out, a lot of these can be merged into literal interpretation. Yeah, they, cla the they clarify. Outcome. Yeah, they clarify mm -hmm. what we mean by literal interpretation. You know? Yeah. Um, okay, Janet, number six. There are multiple senses of seed of Abraham. Thus, the church identification as seed of Abraham does not cancel God's promises to the believing Jewish seed of Abraham. Yeah, words like seed, son, descendants, and all of that. Those words are being used, but context determines how they're being used. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that goes back to literal interpretation. All right. That's just a reminder about narrative show and tell. Thursday events. I'm going to, what, how are we doing on time? So you're already one and a half hour, I think. Okay. Let me see here. How long do y'all want to go? I mean, I got all day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's do, how, we do a little bit longer, Janet. I don't have um, many main slides left. Uh, okay, until I fall asleep in the computer. Like that. <laughs> Got you, yes. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about Elliot Johnson. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, uh, he's he, this is a dispensational biblical theology. And uh, he's saying that he believes that dispensationalism is a philosophy of biblical history. Okay. okay. And uh, um, he's talking about biblical history. And this is important because later on, we're going to be talking about this idea that there's a distinction between event versus revelation. And Saulheimer talked about this idea. But events, we don't have the events uh, preserved for us. Rather, we have mm -hmm. the revelation, which tells us about the events preserved. See, you just, you just answered my question that we are just lower than the... Israel, you know. I don't know how I did that because there's no, there's no, there's no event with us. So only uh, the Gentiles only have revelation, but there's no event. So what that means? I don't know. Keep thinking about that one. But so he's using the word dispensation as management. But mm -hmm. look what he says here: God exercises mm. in salvation history. Huh. I personally don't like the term, but. Yeah you see that dispensationalists do use the term because what he's doing is he's saying that salvation is broader than just individual salvation. You know, that okay. this is the idea of God reworking or repairing or restoring the world, you know, the entirety of the curse. Right. But what I do like is him talking about this partnership idea because it, mm -hmm. it, 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 it goes in line with Dillo. Because that's Dillo's, you know, partaker or partner theory and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of neat. But it's also, it's also, uh-oh, Jonah died. Oh, <laughs> bye, Jonah. <laughs> she back. fell asleep. <laughs> I'm back in life. All right, anyway. Like flies. Yeah. <laughs> but this, I think this comes from covenant language. The partners of the okay. covenant, Okay. Okay. So he says the economies of God's management of stewards are called dispensations. Now look what he does here. He's talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit here. So he's talking about the Trinity. 
and it says right here, God, God the Father manages management allows evil without directly causing it. So right mm -hmm. here, he's interacting with the idea of sovereignty and free will. All right. Okay. And he tells you that he's taking a four point mm -hmm. or or an Amorelian approach. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is also called compatibilism, wherever you have God's sovereignty, but also free will as well. Then it says, God the Son incarnate will assume the role of steward to see God's plan through. So the idea being is that man has failed in every way, right? Yep. And it's evil that's challenging God and his creation by trying to obstruct mankind. So so he's rather it sounds like rather than humanity being tested, he's seeing it more of the angelic conflict being tested idea. Hey Charles, can you give me the reference for this book? Oh, uh, who it is and what it's called. Oh, Elliot, Elliot, yeah, uh, Elliot Johnson, A Dispensational Biblical Theology. Okay, thank you. It's a really good book. Um, I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, then he talks about God the Spirit is at work with humanity to address the conflict with evil. So he's coming in Trinitarian, right? <clears throat> and he's using the term right here that while the spirit is continuing presence throughout history, his presence is more fully displayed following the son's event. So he's mm -hmm. recognizing the dispensational distinctions. Thus, the focus of the interpretation is on God's glory and his glorious ways. Right? Mm -hmm. Sounds like he's saying the glory of God, right? Yeah, it does. It is God's intent to share himself and his glory with creation. So this deals with this idea that this is all about God revealing himself, okay? Uh, since this is salvation history, rather than including all of world history, the scope is limited, all right? If he were, this is a world history, we would turn, touch on other issues like nation, race, gender, and so on. Mm -hmm. He basically says that there's two main purposes of things. And when you're talking about salvation history, is creation purposes and redemption purposes. Okay. Okay. He says that the creation purpose will only be realized in the in the in the millennial kingdom when Christ is the second Adam fulfills things. The redemption purposes is you know throughout the story of the text. Okay. So he right here he says redemption includes addressing the consequences of man's sin in order to restore his chosen partners to their creative role as stewards of the revealed well. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as as he's talking right here, one thing that I like about Elliot Johnson is he basically, without maybe he says it, he pretty much makes the word of God being a requirement for the dispensation to exist. Mm -hmm. That there has to be a steward that's entrusted with the word of God. Okay. If that's if that is one of the requirements for a dispensation then the trinity wouldn't be a dispensation right because the right. members of the trinity know the word of god neither would eternity past or eternity future well we don't know about eternity future but yeah and the angels and so on mm -hmm. um let's see uh i like this language here opportunity to be personal partnership with christ through the stewardship of his word and his will so he really takes the dispensations and makes them applicable because you recognize, all right, well, when I'm studying dispensations, I'm talking about responsibility, stewardship, and we've been entrusted with God's word. You know, are we faithful mm -hmm. to that? Um, he's talking about how Ladd basically said that dispensationalism has contributed so much to Bible study. All right. He's asking the question, what is dispensation? Is what is what progress in revelation has been reached when New Testament authors use the Old Testament text? See, he's already dealing with that issue right there about the priority aspect. And then about validity and value. The validity rests on the unity of biblical theology, because you're tra you're tracing the whole story. So God governs salvation history from beginning to climax and full realization. As God spoke creation into existence, Janet, can you read my throat's dry? So God speaks 
to stewards in history through whom his plan for a fallen creation will be realized. The validity highlights a coherence of incorporating both the fall and redemption, both the kingdom lost and restored. The changes necessitated by the power <laughs> of evil sedu seducing God's own chosen people who in the end will realize what God promised and God's use of Israel's failure in accomplishing the appointment rule for Gentiles. The value of dispensationalism features the distinctive view of the believer's life as a steward of God's will in his appointed time in history. However, the ultimate purpose of telling the story is to have God's story move our hearts to worship for while it is a story of man in history. The story uncovers the glory of God who shares himself to accomplish his will for his own people who loved him and are called according to his purposes. So as he's telling you this, he's using a lot of New Testament language, but he's basically saying if you're studying the dispensations, if you're studying, you know, this biblical theology, it should move your heart to worship, you know. Hopefully these videos that we're doing move people's hearts to worship because they're they're more mindful of the presuppositions and being more careful whenever they come to the text, you know. And it and it helps them understand and appreciate others' contributions. Okay. So look, look, look. Look, look. What? Uh Gabe Line's son. <laughs> right. Oh, this is not the son. Oh, that's Arnold. This right. is Frank. Yeah. Okay. But his son, his son was part of that uh, very large commentary. Uh, okay. Series. But I didn't know that this is where this came into. Look what he says here. Mm -hmm. Gabelin asserts that dispensation is not a theology, but rather a method of interpretation, helpful mm -hmm. grasp in the progress of revelation. And then he says, why we don't explain with that, he could be talking about it's not a systematic theology. Mm -hmm. But watch this. Evangelicals typically define a systematic theology by its soteriology. So we're going back to this issue of where soteriology mm -hmm. fits in this. But dispensationalism is not ultimately defined by its soteriology, which is interesting because he used the word ultimately, which mm -hmm. means that it has a factor in there, you know? Right. Um so dispensationalism uh, bears most resemblance to a biblical theology because you're tracing the story throughout. Mm -hmm. And then here he goes, it's stressing a unique view of the church and eschatology in history. And he's saying that you're using a single and consistent hermeneutic to interpret the whole canon. Yep. All right, so this is where he's talking about Ryrie's doxological glow, the, the glory of God. And then how God manifests his character in different stewardships. He focuses on this and talks about the history of the earth. Okay. Mm -hmm. The first mm -hmm. Christian Christian account. And the, if the in the conflict, evil is tested for value and for power. And see, this is the Batman question. Janet, I don't know if you ever saw the old Batman. Did you ever watch Batman. the old Batman um, TV series? I thought you are. Will Batman escape from the uh, the the hot acid vat? Stay tuned, you know. And <laughs> so the, here here's this question. This is a Batman question. Will the serpent <laughs> and its offspring bring about a good and have the power to achieve its end? You know. Um. So yeah. will the serpent and its offspring bring about good and have the power to achieve its ends? So in Genesis three fifteen, which Dane talked about earlier. <laughs> the battle between God and the serpent is brought into, into play, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and God tells the serpent how things are going to go. That's like, I don't remember what movie it is, but um, the guy tells him like all these martial art moves that he's going to do. He says, uh -huh. I'm, and, and, and he says it almost like in a stupor. And then he says, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to take my foot and kick you here and then do this and do that. And the guy's laughing at him, and the next thing he does, he does all that, you know. And so whenever what I'm is reading, that? is that? Um, I've seen it in a couple smart? movies. 
maybe maybe something like that and uh yeah. i've seen it in a couple movies and, yeah. and it's and it's so funny but it's almost like what god is doing in genesis 3 is like let me tell you mr serpent you know mm -hmm. what i'm gonna do you know you're gonna you're gonna do this strike and whatever but he's gonna crush your head he's gonna crush your kingdom you know oh yeah um at the same time, the conflict will reveal Eve and her offspring is governed by God. And in the conflict with evil, God's glory will be revealed. Think about all this. Think of all the languages being used here. There will be mm -hmm. grace for those overwhelmed by evil and truth challenging the ways of evil. In the end, the glory of grace and truth will overcome and defeat evil in the conflict. So once again, a while ago, he was using Romans 8 language, you know, all, all things work to the glory, you know, and right here he's using John uh, chapter one language about f grace and truth came through there, you know, so the new creation, what Janet was talking about, holds out hope for creation free from evil and with the promise experienced in the fullness of God's glory. Right? And so he's kind of putting the fullness of God's glory even in the eternal state there. Rather than the new creation being a fulfillment of the first creation, it's a fresh start revealing God's glory disclosed in his yet unknown fullness apart from conflict and evil. The biblical story is a theology because it's God's story. The story features dispensations which are distinguished through economies and outworking of God's purpose. So he's keeping Ryrie's definition, but he's saying it's not the glory of God that's the focus. Rather, it's more about how God has entrusted his word. And so as, he, as you're looking at this time, uh, he's seeing evil and conflict with God's word of promise. See, he doesn't start his dispensation until promise. Mm -hmm. He sees he sees Genesis 1 through 11 as just stage setting. Prefatory. In the narrative, yeah. And then this he is has... Alec Johnson? Yeah. Evil okay. directly confronted by God's law, introducing the theocracy, so the Mosaic law. Mm -hmm. Evil overcome by Jesus Christ and, and then his return. <clears throat> he okay, so he with... sees four? Yes. Four dispensations. Yeah. Okay. Eric Sawyer, he's talking about here that the dispensation changes when God is the one that introduces it. It's a household run by God. This description explains what Ryrie means by theology. But the phrase, uh-oh, I don't have that part. I think that's mm. it. Yeah, that's it. All right. So um, let's talk about takeaways real quick. Let me summarize what we're talking about here. I asked the question, you know, what are the essentials of dispensationalism? And I expected that, that Rari's sine qua nons would come to mind, right? Mm -hmm. Which Janet knows. What are the, what are the sine qua nons, Janet? Wait, wait, wait. You are lost there. I am what? You've frozen a couple of times, but okay. I think you're here. Yeah. Oh, so I'm sorry. You're back. Okay. What did you say? What are the sine qua nons of dispensationalism, according to Rari? According to Rari? Mm -hmm. Sine qua non is the story of... Sine story. qua non just means basically essential. What three things do you have to believe in order to be a dispensationalist? Oh, that's what we read earlier, the literal. The, Literal, yeah. What the, else? Wait. You're gonna cheat and look at your notes. <laughs> the literal, the distinction, and the glory of God, or sine Distinction between Israel and the Church and the glory of God, but, <laughs> but, Vlock is saying with well, the glory of God, I don't include. Instead, I'm just writing it down now. I'm not copying. Now, Dane, can you remember Vlock's list of essentials? There's six of them, I think. Eh, no, I can't. But uh, it, it, it's tough. It is. Um, they're they're not quite that uh, pithy. Right. Um, what I would say is the priority and the meaning, you know, is in the passage. Mm -hmm. Typology is involved, but it it doesn't mean that is the church supersedes. Um, who. I don't remember. I, I can go back and look, but I mean, they're harder to remember, you know? And so I, I may try to do a little bit of work, maybe trying to combine mm -hmm. Ryrie's with his so that I can mm -hmm. internalize them a little bit more. 
but mm -hmm. I, I do think they're helpful because they help clarify what we're saying when we right. say literal interpretation and all of that. Mm -hmm. All right, so what are y'all's takeaways? I think what you just said is my takeaway. The, the literal interpretation is the overarching necessity for dispensationalism. And then uh, different, different people have stressed different issues within that, but those are all points of clarification, not necessarily the, uh, the distinguishing factor. The distinguishing factor is a consistent literal interpretation. Okay. Janet, what about you? I cannot think. The medicine is already ruining my brain. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll have I'm Janet sorry. watch the video, and that think. way she can think next time we do a video. Yeah, so. sure. I expected my comments. All right. Dane, will you pray us out? Sure. Dear Father, I thank you for this time that we can come together across nations and at different times and still study your word together. I pray a blessing over our nation and over this world. Uh, truly, we live in dark times, but you are still reigning on your eternal throne, and we anticipate your kingdom with praise and worship. Lord, we ask you come quickly, and we ask that we abide faithfully until that time, sharing your word and understanding you better. We ask these things, Lord, in your name. Amen. 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 Janet, you want to tell the audience what they can do? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, guys, uh, if you... If, uh, if you're blessed by this video, uh, but before that, uh, subscribe Dane's uh, YouTube channel if you don't, if you are not uh, subscribed yet, and and also Layman and my YouTube channel, and also support my Facebook page, The Own Bible with Janet. So yeah, share this video to others so that the others bless also, but uh, so that this ministry would be, you know, uh, a blessing. Mm -hmm. Did you notice that the medicine didn't affect you doing that part? <laughs> <laughs> Muscle memory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good job. All right. Well, thank y'all very much.